retirement savings board meetings. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is June the 27th, 2023 at 2.45 p.m. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is the uh, sound okay? Yes. Okay, excellent, thank you. This is a public meeting under Hawaii Sunshine Law, which we are conducting in person as well as Zoom, and this meeting is being recorded. To start the meeting and to document in the minutes, I will ask board members to introduce themselves with their name and their organization if applicable. Um, note remote board members. Please note that uh, at the advice of the Department of the Attorney General, the chat box has been disabled, so it's important to identify yourself and your organization if applicable. Uh, I'll start. My name is Bill Kunstman, and I am the Deputy Director of the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations, and I am the Director of Labor's designee as co-chair of this board. Uh, maybe we can go um, to my right and... Um, Hi, uh, Michael Moriyama, Deputy Attorney General. Andrew Nomura, member of the board. Brian Taniuchi, um, I guess the retiree uh, representative. Barbara Creed, member of the board. Jesse Keola, Dean, member of the board. And then I see we also have Senator Moriwaki. Uh -huh. um, representing the Senate, um, non voting <laughs> member. And I also see Director. Lewis is on Zoom. Yep, uh, Bill. Sorry, I can't be there in person, but uh, uh, I'm here. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, is there anybody else from the board with us today? I don't believe so at this point. And just to give everybody an update, we did get a memo from the speaker's office from the house, and Andrew Takuya Garrett has been appointed. Um, as the ex officio member from the House. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to allow public members present, present to introduce themselves and their organization they represent on a voluntary basis. Uh, if you're not alone in your room, you, you could also please introduce yourself or introduce those you are with. Uh, does anybody from the public want to introduce themselves? Uh, aloha. Chair, this is Kelly E. Lopez with AARP Hawaii. Um, it's just me, and thank you for allowing public participation. You're welcome. Is there anybody else from the public non-board members who would like to introduce themselves? Hi, it's Angela Antonelli from the Georgetown University Center for Retirement Initiatives. Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you, Angela. Do we have anybody else who wishes to introduce themselves? If not, let's go ahead and move to agenda item number two, the approval of the minutes for the June 9, 2023 meeting. Is there any discussion about the meet, uh, about the minutes? No. Yeah. Okay. Second. And Keola seconds. Any further discussion? Otherwise, uh, say aye, all those who approve. Aye. 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 Okay, motion carry. Um, our next agenda item, agenda item four, pertains to the Sunshine Law. Uh, there was a question raised last time by one of the board members, and Ms. Krieg actually uh, had a question regarding the uh, board quorum. Uh, which governs not only how the board and the meetings conducts its business, but also becomes important vis-a-vis -vis other laws, such as the Sunshine Law, the Permitted Interaction Groups, et cetera. And our board has in its um, statutory provisions 389-3-E, which um, specifically states that um, quorum is four out of the seven board members, so it excludes the ex officio members from the House and the Senate. And therefore, that also makes the non quorum of the board three members or less. Um, any questions about that? 
comments? Okay, and then we did want to go over and formally go over the permitted interaction groups pursuant to the Sunshine Law. And uh, we included in the board packet this uh, thing from the Office of Information, uh, Office of Information Practices. It's their quick review part three, which was revised in December of 2022. Um, and I can uh, boil it down to you. It's uh, any kind of um, PIG is a three-step process. Um, so in the first meeting, what is required is that the assignment of the board members is uh, given and then the scope of the authority of the investigation and the scope of the authority of the board members are uh, required, again, less than a quorum, so that would be three members of that. Um, at that after that first meeting, after you set the pig in motion, you cannot add new members or any issues to the pig, so you have to set forth the whole thing at the first meeting, and that cannot change throughout the pig process. Um, at a second or subsequent meeting of the board, that's when the findings and the recommendations can be presented to the board, but the board cannot discuss or deliberate about those findings or recommendations at that point. At that point, also the pig dissolves. And that's a relatively new, um, based on an opinion, a formal opinion from OIP that was just late last year. So um, that's a further delineation of the how a pig can operate. Then at the third meeting, that's when the board may discuss, deliberate, uh, and make decisions or take action about what the uh, pig's recommendations or findings are. Um, some further information about pigs is that uh, it is not a committee, so it is not subject to the Sunshine Laws requirements for public notice, open meetings, or keeping minutes. Um, they may also solicit public input without filing a notice or an agenda. Pigs may also include non-board members, uh, but they cannot consult with the other board members. Uh, board members that are not part of the PIG may not attend PIG meetings or be included in any of the communications between the PIG members. And just to reiterate, new board members or issues cannot be added to this PIG after the first meeting. Any questions or comments? I, I, ha I have one. Um, I thought last at the last meeting we decided not to have a pig that we could we could have a selection committee and and uh, you know conduct it as a personnel action. Are we going back to having a pig? Um, you may the board may or may not choose to do that, but I just wanted to formally cover and uh, reiterate what how a pig what a pig is and how it operates. So the board members are informed as far as how that operates, whether they choose, whether you choose to do that for the hiring or not, that's a, something we can discuss a little bit later on in the agenda. Mm. Okay, uh, any other comments or thoughts? Uh, if not, um, I also wanted to take a, a Opportunity, you know, we skipped over. Um, well, I wanted to make sure that we give the opportunity so that if there's any members of the public who want to present testimony on this agenda item, uh, opportunity to do so. Is there anybody that wishes to? If not, we can go on to um, agenda item number five budget. Uh, in your packet as well, we wanted to provide you so you would have documentation of the budget, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the uh, appropriations for the maintenance or the uh, um, implementation and operation of the program. So this section four is that section in Act 296 that provided funds authorized uh, or gave an appropriation to the department to carry out the implementation and operation 
of the program. Um, you'll note in the language in section four of Act 296 that it says explicitly referred to an executive director, a program specialist, and an office assistant. Um, if you note, uh, the other handout we included pertaining to this part was the actual improvement of the uh, release, the allot and expense of that money from the governor. Um, and it references a couple of things I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, I had mentioned um, in previous meetings that we uh, administratively changed the office assistant to a, a secretary position in order to, uh, based on conferring with our HR, um, not only the functional, um, what we saw as the functional requirements of the position, but also the um, ability to recruit office assistants are very difficult to recruit and maintain um, with the state. Um, the other uh, noteworthy part of the allotment memo is that it makes reference to the contingency restrictions that are a part of the executive budget um, every year. So it reflects the release, uh, even though the appropriation in the bill was 1.255, what was released was 1.129500, and that reflects um, all appropriations, general fund appropriations are subject to a 5%, um, what's called a hard and contingency restrictions um, as a general matter of uh, how the budget operates. Um, so if the uh, program, and in this case, if the board wanted their full allotment, that's something that we would um, have to request administratively. And that is also, I understand, applicable. The intention is for that to be applicable moving forward. Um, we've gotten the uh, what they call interim budget execution instructions from budget and finance for the first quarter of fiscal year 23-24, and it also maintains the 10%, 5% uh, each hard and contingency restrictions. So I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that and understood it. Any questions or comments? Yeah, what was the, what was the fire with the 10, minus the 10%, what was the amount? Uh, one, uh, 1, 500,000. Thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> House Bill 300, um, that was the budget bill that was passed by the legislature this year. And uh, because Act 296 was a standalone bill for the creation of the program and the budget, uh, the executive branch went in and requested to put the program formally on the budget, which is what we did through governor's message number one, which the legislature did approve. So. Uh, you have a worksheet. This is the worksheet. I think we uh, had referenced it earlier. This has the governor's message and it has the uh, breakout of the expenses um, for the program for both the current fiscal or the upcoming fiscal year 23 24 as well as uh, 24 25. Any questions or comments? Okay, uh, does anybody from the public want to make any comment or provide any testimony on that item? Seeing none, moving on. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, what is the sample expenditure report been provided for? Okay, I will get to that shortly oh, on the next That's agenda good. item, no right. problem. So, um, the, we're, this agenda item is for authorization and approval for us to spend those money, those monies, the DLIR on behalf of the board. So we have not spent any money so, so far because in order to spend money, it's actually the board that needs to spend money or delegate that to the executive director to spend money or delegate it to the department. So um, that can be found in the powers and duties of the board 389-4. There's provisions in there, including 
Uh, a four, a, a pause expenses incurred to initiate, implement, maintain, and administer the program uh, to be paid from the program and other available sources. 389.4A15, provide for the payment of costs of administration and operation of the program. And 389.4A19, reimburse when appropriate, when appropriate, the general fund of the state of Hawaii for the initial expenses incurred for initiating, implementing, maintaining, and administering the program. So in regards to Barbara's uh, question, um, if the uh, if the board approves of the department expending funds for the initiation and operation of the program, um, then we can do so. And then what we would do is on our end, we have this monthly, this is the uh, board packet material. It shows another fund in the past. This is a happens to be a special fund. So this is the kind of report we would get from our ASO, our fiscal office that we could provide to the board um, after the end of the month. So whenever we had a board meeting, we could provide you folks with this so you can see um, all the, this would be the breakout to show you what the, the funds would be spent on. And this would be separate from any kind of um, employment decisions. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, in order to, to uh, hire somebody that also is requires board approval. So um, the idea is if you folks are amenable, then if we could have a motion, then we could, the idea would be, we haven't done any, what we call charging yet to this account because we don't have the board's approval. The idea would be if you folks would uh, approve of it, then we would start on uh, July the 1st at the beginning of the next fiscal year. And um, so on our end, what we would do for, we would capture the costs involved of both the services from our AG, from myself, from Nancy, from HR, when they do anything for the board, and from fiscal. And we would do that by just filling out a timesheet and then turning it into our fiscal office. And then monthly, they would turn around and give us um, this report. Um, so any questions or comments? So you're saying that the funds that have been authorized for our program would sort of supplant part of your salary, Nancy's salary plus overhead for the time that you spend or any of your staff spends on the program work? Is that, I mean, that that's different from my experience. And so I just wasn't familiar with that. I'm not sure what you mean by supplant. So you say that that we get an accounting of funds that are being charged to the program, right? Yeah. For work that you do or work that Nancy does or anybody else on DLIR staff. Right. Is is that and is that like salary and overhead for I don't know, let's say 10 hours and that's whatever percentage of your the annual salary and overhead? Um it would just be the salary, the overhead for the most part for I'm not sure about the AGs. But I know for the department, if it's general funded position, then it's just the it's just the salary. Like I said, I'm I'm just have, I wasn't familiar with that. That wasn't how any of the programs that I had worked on had ever operated. Uh, so for Department of Labor, it's not really unusual. We have a lot of federal grant funding um, and regular federal grants. So a lot of our staff charge to depending on what they're actually doing at the time they charge to that grant or whatever but if that we're talking general funds in our program and presumably general funds on DLF you know director deputy right director's office staff right so I've just not seen it is that customary I guess this is a question more for Lewis is it customary then to charge general funds to reimburse general funds uh no it's not, and not not for the directors. I think we we're going to probably have to have a conversation about that. I mean, I could see the administrative costs. I, I think for Nancy or something for the amount of time that she's spending on it. But I think for for the most part, for for cabinet members, it, it, this is we don't 
we're already we're already salaried and we're already paid and our and our salary is determined by you know uh, uh, by hmm. by the commission so the, the thing is it doesn't matter right whether whether or not you pay from it from general funds other ways if if we're going to reimburse you know for somebody's time the question is is what happens to that other time that uh or the other savings that 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 you would incur right so the salary of the director and the deputy is already budgeted, so that shouldn't be uh, cost allocated back. Uh, to, but to Bill's point, I think they do it a lot for federal programs because they do that for calculation of uh, uh, cost sharing mechanisms as well as um, uh, uh, for a state share. So it's it's not uncommon, but it's not a practice that we do for the state. So Lewis, just a question, a follow up question, because. I can see it for the federal, like you say, but if it's for the state, you're, you're just taking it from the same pot and moving it around. So uh, unless this program is so separated, you know, Hawaii Saves is so separated that you um, you charge it to the program. But it seems like we're all part of the startup. And then after that, it would be, you know, on the on its own. So I yeah. don't know. You know, it seems to be. Charge. It's one of the reasons why I think we really need to, I mean, I think first order, what we really need to do is get, get on the process of, of bringing in uh, staff as quickly as possible. Yes, right. yes. Hey, so the, I can understand the deputy director, but the intention behind reimbursing the salaries was because the uh, 389-4A19 says reimburse when appropriate the general fund of the state of Hawaii for the initial expense incurred for initiating, implementing, maintaining and administering the program. So that would seem to say that if I, you know, I don't know it's general fund, general fund, but part of the thought was that it would also give the board an idea of the administrative costs associated when it no longer is a purely general funded program either. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, no. Yeah, I, I think as we set it up, uh, and I think, I mean, this, this is the discussion that we need to happen because that has to happen because we need to figure out how we're going to structure this thing uh, going forward. Um, but, uh, it's again it's probably worth uh another discussion with regards to you know cost allocation right um like i said i could see i could see the administrative support like you know the stuff that nancy is doing uh and everything could get reimbursed uh her pay her time on that but for us right uh, the and any cabinet member it's it's other duties as assigned it's not mm -hmm. like we're taking on any you know um uh, we, we take on anything and everything that we're given and it's 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 not a reimbursement to the department but the the thing is the truth is i will probably going to lapse all of the, most of that money anyway for fy23 i mean we literally only have three more days to do it so there's really not much that we've expended we haven't expended anything yeah and so so we're, we're we're just gonna lapse and then we'll just work off the what is it the 1.2 million that we have for fiscal year 24, right? Correct. Yeah. But the, the question is, you want approval for to move moving forward from July 1st? That's that point, right. That's right. I mean, whether it's approval for the expenditure of monies for just supplies, or if we buy the computers, or whatever for the program, or to include staff time excluding the deputy pursuant to what lewis said i think on our end whether or not the board approves it we'll still track the staff time whether we charge or not so you can see what what, what the associated cost implications are of hr doing whatever they do for the hiring whatever fiscal does for the processing and the paperwork and all that yeah because because i'm looking at the breakdown right of the budget right so for FY24, <clears throat> uh, there's the the two the three salaries, right? The executive director, program specialist, and the secretary. Uh, and then there's two thousand dollars for computer software and licenses, 
and then $15,000 for travel. And then there's a $1 million appropriation for an actuarial study of retirement savings programs. And so, It's a, I guess we're going to, I mean, it's, that's not really an actuary. It's just a study, I think, of, uh, of other retirement savings programs, because I don't think we have anything to do an actuarial study on our existing program right now. Because we don't have anybody yet. So we don't have any accrued liability. We only have the $25 million of uh, initial seed money uh, to the special fund. But if the intention is to come up with a, a decision that if the board needs to make a motion in order to allow the, you know, uh, the department to start expending money for, for those things, that's fine. I'll make the motion if that's necessary. Okay, we have a motion. That's going to be a Is there any discussion? So the motion is to the motion is to effective July first to start accruing expenses on on behalf of this program. Hmm. Or keep you track of expense. Can you restate your motion? Okay, so I think the motion is to allow for the Department of Labor to begin incurring expenses effective July first, uh, twenty twenty three, for on behalf of the Hawaii Retirement Savings Program. As I understand, we're actually delegating the authority to the DLIR to make those expenditures on behalf of the board. Do we not approve the uh, expenditures in advance? Or I'm just questioning, does it cost a million dollars to do that actuarial study? I have no idea. So how but I would hope that, the, you know, that it, before we make any type of, I mean, other than normal operating expenditures, which I think at least I'm okay with them executing on stuff, but again, there is no office. We don't have any employees yet for this place. Um, but any other large expenditure, I mean, the board can make a can make a, you know, a condition that any expenditure above ten thousand dollars needs board's approval. If that was if that was the case. So for the feasibility study, I can address that. Because the feasibility study require board action and board approval, that million dollars couldn't be expended in any other way. And to go back to what Lewis said, this is just kind of a general blanket to, to be able to, uh, expend, to expend funds on behalf of the board for whatever the normal operating expenses are. Now, whether you folks want to approve that more specifically, like for reimbursement for the costs associated with Nancy or HR or whatever, so let's clarify that. But yeah, and then any kind of hiring would be also a separate board approval. So, is that help? No, not really. I'm just curious about um, one million for the actuarial study. So the where one, did we come so up with that from? So the one million for the actuarial study was developed in consultation between the legislature and the director at the time, going and looking at um, what other actuarial studies had been estimated to cost. So we had had a appropriation, um, I think in 16 or 17, that was somewhere around $350,000 for an actuarial study for a workers' compensation. And at that time, we did not, or it's actually the auditor had the money, but they did not expend the money because they could not find anybody to do it for $350,000. So I think the million dollars was back of the envelope math guesstimation for what an actuarial study might cost at that time, which was 2021. But I don't think it was um a how should i say a robust estimation or appropriation and i think that goes back to um what lewis had said depending on what the feasibility study actually what the procurement is and the scope and all that other stuff i think there's some flexibility 
as far as how the total appropriation could be spent. So the 1 million is just an estimate and it's not stated as up to $1 million. Yeah, at this point in time, it's uh, it's up to 1 million, but I mean, could be less. Okay. Okay. The only thing, and, and I'm sorry, Bill, the only thing that I want, and, and maybe it's just me that's saying that, is that we're not, there's nothing to do an actuarial study on our retirement savings program because we don't have participants yet. We don't have liabilities that we're running against the current corpus that's in the retirement savings account right now. So I'm just not sure. We just need to figure out what what is what's what was the intent, the legislative intent for this particular appropriation, and whether or not we can use it for you know for a a study of retirement savings programs or maybe you know a retire an actuarial study for a, re a similar retirement savings program with you know and and a projected growth rate of the number of members over x amount of days what would our requirements for um for funding within the corpus need to be in order for the account the trust fund to remain solvent that it's so because there's nothing really for us to study right now for our existing uh, retirement savings account. Yeah, so like a break even study. I mean, it, this is yeah. not a tutorial study, right? This is not insurance. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's a feasibility study. And yeah. uh, my question is um, the 1 million is an estimate. Would we be able to repurpose some of that 1 million to uh, establish a more competitive salary schedule for the executive director? I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll provide my, my particular sense of it. I, I think that there is an opportunity, but we would want to have that discussion with the people who uh, uh, drafted the legislation for the program, uh, as well as the, you know, the two money committees in terms of, you know, what was in there. But normally we, the budget worksheets are an indication of legislative intent and we don't want to deviate from it. So how would we go about getting that information of what mm -hmm. is legislative intent here? Well, the legislative intent was very specific in the budget worksheets. I mean, uh, and so, uh, I, I think I would want to have the conversation with the legislators uh, to get it specifically from them in terms of like, you know, uh, it, it, it's just we just need to socialize that discussion. I mean, there is some discretion, I think, in order to provide, you know, a more competitive salary for the for the executive director. But before we do that, I just want to make sure that every our funders in this particular case, the legislature is OK with us repurposing some of that money. Yeah, Louis, so uh, I think uh, language in the budget worksheets, as far as my recollection, is that the that language is more like guidance, it's not law. The only law that was actually passed was the yep. law figures that are in the budget bill itself. So the yep. budget worksheets are not passed as part of the budget. They are uh, kind of a guide to legislation. Well, to the administration as to what the legislature was thinking. Yeah. Um, part of the yeah. thing at the time, I guess, was that uh, we did have opposition in the House. Uh, and um, some of the things that um, the opposition was kind of throwing out were these, you know, uh, actuarial study, uh, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and so part, and part of it was them trying to. Uh, work out uh, a bill that passed the house that <laughs> would at least allow us to go to conference and try to work out some of these things mm -hmm. uh, in conference we weren't able to we didn't budge and so uh, the only thing we were able to actually extract was that we cleared up some of the language you know, uh, as far as departments could have concerns about some of the language of the uh, house draft and so we cleared some of that stuff up, but we, that we didn't we weren't able to do a lot of things because it wasn't really too, too, too. 
So that, that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think um, uh, if we were to proceed with trying to see, I think we should probably get a better idea of what kind of salaries we really need. Uh, having listened to this first 20 minutes of seminar, I, just think, I realized that there's like four or five other program state programs on the payment that are starting up and they're all looking for executive directors they're all looking for staff you know so it's kind of it's going to be very competitive and so i think i don't see where the legislature would say well i can't bite into that you know, really but i think we have to kind of like bill said we're going to kind of approach them tell them just the kind of issues we have i think uh, probably uh, talk to them for too long i guess Money chairs. Yeah, money chairs and labor chairs, and to at least touch base with them to see that it's okay. And I think, well, I, I think it would be, but I'm not, you know, not positive. So we, we do have to kind of go through that exercise. Yeah, and then to just digress a little bit, you know, we will have a further discussion later in the agenda about the actually going out and recruitment process. So that might clarify and help this particular item as well. But, um, so, we have a motion. Is there any other further discussion? I guess I just have one question. So um, this is a general um, approval for the department to be able to expend monies. Is it the board's understanding then that um, we will keep track of all the expenses outside of the deputy that's being that's that are occurring because of this program and to, is that um something that the war is part of this motion or is it just the general general approval and then do you want to have a further discussion about whether what to include in any specifics for myself i would say when you delegate the authority to spend the monies, then yes, you expect whoever's extending those funds to be accountable, and whatever report form is customary would probably be acceptable to us. Um, as long as the expenses that are being charged to our program funds are, in fact, expenses that are customarily charged um, <coughs> one general fund program to another. Okay. Okay. If there's no other further discussion, maybe we can have the vote then. And did we set ten thousand as the threshold? Oh, I, I was just I just threw that out there as a number. And then you know we could go much lower than that if that I mean I don't expect us to be spending that level of money. What it what's the current uh, authorization for a small procurement right now, Bill. Do you know offhand? No. Yes, hundred thousand. Is it a hundred thousand, Lewis? <laughs> no, no. I'm talking small procurement. Is it not? Is it a hundred thousand? Yeah. 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 Okay. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Is it fifteen? Okay. So then, so then, ten is not unreasonable, I guess. Let's just stay with the 15. Yeah. And we won't be confused. Yeah. Okay. So you, you Louis, you want to amend your um your motion to include sure. thousand dollar cap. Sure. So uh, so the motion is to allow for the department, Department of Labor, to begin uh uh expending funds out of the appropriation that was granted for the Hawaii Retirement Savings Program uh, um, up to a $15,000 limit. Anything above that still requires board approval. Okay. Oh, second that. <laughs> Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All say nay. Okay, motion carries. Um, our next agenda item is hiring. 
the board's authority to employ an executive director and other staff. And I'm going to turn it over to Michael um, to explain uh, the interpretation of our statute, the board statute, and other general comments. So I think we start with um, 389.3F. And so that allows the board, for its two co chairs with approval of the board, to hire an executive director and staff to carry out its functions. So the question becomes what are the procedures that the board has to follow in order to hire an ED and staff? Um, so I think to sort of uh, analyze this issue, we broke up the entire hiring process in sort of three steps. So the first step is sort of establishing the ED position. We're talking specifically about the ED position. So the first step is the board's decision to establish the position. Then the, in, within that first step, then the board will establish the position description and then determine what authority the ED will have pursuant to the statute. The second step would be what we call the screening process. So that would be screening all the applications and resumes to make sure the applicants are qualified, um, scheduling interviews, uh, setting, um, drafting interview questions, uh, conducting interviews, and then making the hiring recommendations to the board or the coaches. And then the third and final step would be um, the final selection where the board goes out and they make an offer and hire an ED. So talking to OI about what the board can do versus what other people can do. OIP's opinion is that all three steps constitute board business. So the board has to be involved in all these steps. And they can do it with the assistance of labor staff. The sort of different AG opinion is that steps one and three constitute board business. So that would be have to be done by the board or the court chairs with the approval of the board. And step two, the screening process wouldn't constitute board business. So that could be delegated entirely to labor staff. The twist is if some board members want to participate in the screening process of so, you know, participating in the screening of the resumes, doing interviews and stuff, the age of being that. Now you're getting into murky waters of whether it's board business or not. And so the recommendation there would be if board members, if some but not all and less than a quarter of board members want to participate in the screening process, then a pig should be established. So to clarify, when you say board business, you mean to sunshine. Subject to sunshine, but step two and three would be done in executive uh, session. What do you have to keep? How does that, I'm sorry, how does that work to keep minutes during an executive session here? You're required to keep minutes. Uh, but what, what is required to be included in the minutes of an executive session? I think the deed would be up to the board, but you have to have a record of what was discussed and decided. And so what, what that means, um, the board would have to make the determination. What is the percentage of the board that would have to do it? Is it only that percentage? Well, no, if so if the board decides to delegate the screening process step two to labor staff, um, we think that that can be done. It's complicated. Some board members express an interest in participating in that screening process. So if some but less than a quorum of board members want to participate in that process, then the issue becomes murky and it starts sliding more towards that, con that, that process will now constitute board business because you have board members participate. And therefore our recommendation would be to establish a period. So quorum is? For others. Yes, Michael. Are we as a board able to establish the uh, screening criteria and scoring? Yeah, I think the way it would work, you would set the position description, sort of the minimum qualifications, and then you could set the authority of the ED. And then 
you know, the, the screen, uh, whoever the screeners are, when you get the application resume, they have to balance that against the, uh, what you guys establish as a minimum qualifications and see if these people qualify. Uh, the, uh, so you could delegate to labor staff if there's enough of a um, parameter that they're going to uh, carry out that function. So scoring brings up a separate issue. So what we're being told is that when you score applicants, if it's you know like a num numeric scoring, you're pretty much stuck with the person that achieves the highest score. So the recommendation is if you want to build a little bit more flexibility into the process, not to have a hard numerical scoring system. <laughs> Are there other non-scoring systems? <laughs> yeah, I mean, or something? yeah, we're being told that have a numerical scoring system. <laughs> <laughs> so you can base it on you know years of experience and you know even even the quali quality of the experience. So suppose we did a hybrid of this, and that is delegate to DLIRHR to go through you know, screening interview candidates um, and recommend their top three and the board grade the pig to interview the top three and select from among them. Yeah, I think you can do that. So we would have DLIR do mm -hmm. what they do. Then when we do the pig, it is for the sole purpose. We would have to establish a pig, obviously, for the purpose of having the two or three, hopefully three, you know, board members do the final interviews. Right. And then that would go to what Bill was talking about, the pig in general, right? So you'd have to right. have a meeting that would establish the parameters of the pig, who the members would be, then um, the pig would go out and, and you know, do, it. do the interview process of the three recommended, recommended candidates. Then the pig would have to come back to a subsequent board meeting, report their findings, and then you'd have to have a third subsequent meeting after that meet, the reporting meeting where the board could actually vote and decide on the hiring. Right. Although I would assume that because we're dealing with proxy sensitive personnel matter, that the pig's recommendation would be done in executive session. Yes. Okay. Similar, you know, what the board of ed did. Yes. That's right. Okay, I got it. Well, could be that just adds steps to the process. So couldn't handle it just in an executive session. <laughs> We're going to the board going to executive session to um, go over the recommendations of the staff as far as um, you, you could. It, so, I guess the question is, are you so if you want a pig to consider the rec the three recommended candidates, then you have to go through the whole process, the pig process. You could not do a pig and just have the, the labor staff present recommendations to the full board in executive session and the full board could decide. Or you could present it to the co-chairs because the statute allows the co-chairs to um, do the hiring subject to the approval of the full board. So you could do everything in executive session um, with or without a pig. I shouldn't say could. You have to do it in the executive session with or without, and that could be done with or without. Food. But the pig just lengthens the step higher. Yes, because you have to go through that three meeting process. And you know, that first part where you're setting the parameters and authority of the pig and you know the members and what exactly you're going to do that could you know that might not be settled in a single meeting, right? So, so again, to just make sure I understand correctly. DLIR can go through the entire process, but rather than actually selecting, comes up with three top recommendations. And then we go into executive session and the staff would present to us the resumes, the interview results, could answer any questions we had about their impressions. Um, and then the board would select from among the three. 
Yes. And that could be done without it in a single executive session should yes. the board feel yes. comfortable making a decision then. Yes. So that would entail the department doing like the interview questions, the written question, and one. <laughs> all, all that would be all a department. And right. we would just go through, screen the applications, select the ones for interviews, and then, okay. Right. Would we be able to have uh, the three candidates come and present during executive session? I don't see why. Yeah, I, I think you could. Yeah, I, I've seen it done in the past. Oh, okay. Could we also have a non board member? Can the, can, can the board you know, involve non board members in the process? You know, as an example, if we were to say we'd like somebody from AARP, you know, and they've been so instrumental in, in this process, serve on the um, interview committee. Uh, or I don't know if somebody from Pew would be willing to sit on the interview committee. Is is that something we could do, Bill? I would think it depends. Okay, so I think we're talking about two different animals here at this point. One is where there's a pig and where there's not a pig. And I think where there's not a pig, I think whoever is on in the panel and all that, that would be we commonly do that. We have people from the outside or whatever. And, the pig, I would, as far as I'll defer them to the AG. No, yeah. I think we're all trying to do this without a pig. I think even without the pig, I think you can have non board members involved in the process. With the pig, you have to establish the person early at the beginning. So. Yeah, I think it'd be cleaner if you're going to have a pig to you know, set all those parameters up at the beginning. <clears throat> you don't want a pig. It, it mentions the process. So if we're not having a pay, the question is, when do we have to tell you who we want? Let's say whoever we would like to have. Well, we don't. Who's going to tell us? We don't. We don't say who goes on the selection committee. No, I mean who is not a member. You were asking if you could bring somebody else in, right? No, I'm saying that DLIR can okay. bring in non-board okay. members who are also involved in this program. Okay. Or, and I'm familiar with the program. That's really, I think, the key. So just one question for clarification. So that would be the co-chairs doing the, the process and then coming up with recommendations to the board or well, I think whether it's the co-chairs or just the department, it doesn't matter. Yeah, because I think the statute allows co-chairs to do it subject to the approval of the full board. So co-chairs, you know, co-chairs can do everything. Um, steps one, two, and three if they want it. Or they can do steps one and three, delegate the screening process to labor staff. Uh, the co-chairs could select amongst the recommendations and then you know, subject to the approval of the board, a subsequent approval of the board. So that, that's another um, alternative. Because usually when we do like that hiring process, we have a panel, it would be the, like usually the administrator or the senior level staff of the program would be involved anyway, so. Yeah, I think if you wanted to avoid a pig, but kind of streamline the process, by statute, you could have the co-chairs do everything with the assistance of labor staff. So in this case, obviously, Bill, you're one of the co-chairs, and I would assume that you're, I wouldn't say supervising, but you're the one who's been coordinating with your HR staff, isn't that right? Yes. So we already have half of the co-chairs being involved in the process, whether we call it DLIR or whether we call it co-chairs. I'm not sure that Lewis has the interest or the, the, the time um, to be as intimately involved in the recruiting process, unless you love the state recruiting process, Lewis, and would prefer to be very involved. You know, I, I dedicate as much time as possible. Uh, you know, it is my number one priority to make, uh, you know, uh, to make everybody on this board happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good 
I, I think we I think there's a good process in place by utilizing uh, the existing infrastructure within uh, the Department of uh, Labor. Um, and so, I mean, with with Bill's involvement already intimately involved with it already because it falls within his department. I'm very comfortable with that continuing going forward. Bill, do you have any concerns about that? uh no i don't think so i mean it would just we would have to do the due diligence on our part to make sure we did a good hiring process from uh, some of that i think is a board action and some of it isn't so the moving forward with the recruitment you know i mean um, as long as we um did a good packet and a good panel, then I think it would be okay. And I think we could do that. I would be confident. Yeah, I think if the co-chairs were gonna you know do the entire process. So I think the co-chairs would go through step one, get board approval. Uh, they would engage in step two with the help of um, labor staff. They, the co-chairs would decide to make the final offer um, subject to board approval. And, Co-chairs could hire. But again, I think we're talking not co-chairs. I think we're talking DLIR with because the, the, when we when we say DLIR staff, we get Bill included in that for free. Yeah, exactly. No, okay. So <laughs> I think what Barbara's saying, you're saying that you would the, with the, the the thought is to have us do the process and come up with like three candidates. Your top three candidates. And then they have the board involved in an executive session outside of a pig at some level to to have some interaction with the candidates and to make a, dis, a hiring decision at some point based on that, not just us turning everything over and saying, here's one, two, and three, right? Right. That's that that's the way I'm envisioning it. Yeah. Happy to your other ideas that makes that to me seems to make the most sense. Yeah, I think that that would be all right by the department. Because from what I recall, you were saying like the first step is you know the first part of the process. We're already there, right? We move the position description that does include the minimum qualifications, responsibilities, you know, all those good things, and then. DLIR has what it needs then to take over the process uh, right. until such time as they can come to us with to recommended candidates, right? Right. Yeah. So I think we yeah, anticipated so that DLR's LI on staff will make the three recommendations and say, here's the recommendations and here they are in the executive session and then. That gives the board the opportunity to interact with the Right, and then we can make our decision from there. So that's a consensus. Do we need a motion or is it just? I, I think you need a motion as, as the position description being decided on. Yeah, okay. So um, I don't think we need a motion to to start in that direction. I just wanted to double check, but yeah. So if that's the case, um, this was agenda item 6A, I, and then there was also, we had on the agenda um, discussion of 2635 HRS, and that's just the, um, the statute that governs the board and what, delineates the, what are purely board responsibilities until they are delegated and how the board is administratively attached to DLIR. So, you know, certain things like fiscal stuff still needs to get approved by the director and things like that. So, um, if that's the case, um, is there any public comment or testimony on uh, either agenda item uh, under 6A, hiring, if not, we can move on to uh, 6B, which is the executive director. And just to clarify, we had a discussion last time 
and the board approved us going ahead and making a uh, changing the, the education requirement to a general education requirement. So we actually revised the position description. And so the position description that's included in your packet reflects that change that we made. And so if that's okay with the board, then we could vote to, we could ask for a vote to have the board to that position description. Right, the position description as presented in the board material. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, the next agenda item is the report from the DLIR on the recruitment process. So um, in conferring with our HR, um, we can um, go out and advertise this position in a few different ways. One of them would be with a salary range, or one would be um, salary commensurate with education and experience. Uh, so depending on how the board would like us to proceed with that, uh, the thought was we could go out with the salary commensurate with education and experience and not include a range on there. And when I went and I looked, um, okay, so because this is a exempt position, um, this is something that um, we would do the lion's share of. We would actually go post it on the D or third non-civil service position site. So uh, the good news, the positive part about that is that we retain uh, a lot more control. So, um, the other parameter that is com that's commonly set forth is whether you open up a position for recruitment during a definite set period of time or whether you do it continuously or until you get X number of applicants or whatever. So um, that's also something that the board, the board wants to um, has any inclination as far as that go. The, the discussion that we had internally was um, putting the position out with our, I guess our recommendation would be with the salary commensurate with education experience and to do it on a continuous basis. So then we would get resumes in over a period of time and be able to sift and whittle through more resumes rather than less. And so if that's okay with the board, we can go ahead and, and do that. Okay. Um, okay, we can do that then. And then is there anybody in the public who would like to provide a comment or testimony on uh, 6B, this discussion regarding the executive director, either um, regarding the position description or the um, actual um, Initiating the recruitment process. Seeing none, moving on then. Um, the next agenda item under hiring is the program specialist. There was a suggestion last time about um, perhaps hiring a temporary nine day hire um, specialist to help with um, the board's administrative workload, whatever that um, Lewis had made. So um, because this, uh, the, the discussion or the, what we had set forth at the beginning was we bring on the executive director and then the executive director would do a position description for this particular thing. But we can do a position description that can be amended later by the executive director for maybe a, a further refinement of whatever that position would be to do, but as an option for the board, if the board wanted to, the department would be willing to do a position description to be approved by the board. And then from thence ask for permission to go out and recruit an 89 day hire to temporarily fill that position until a more permanent position could be brought on board, presumably pursuant to our earlier discussions um, hired by the executive director. So at this point, the question would be, would the board um, 
approve of the department, drafting a position description for your consideration um, for the board to take up at a subsequent meeting to decide whether or not you approve of the position description and of doing recruitment to hire somebody to do um, the, the program specialist position on a temporary basis. So I'm not sure, can't forecast exactly how the executive di director recruitment is going to go. So the, kind of the thought was to put something else in motion also. So, you know. Uh, who would be supervising that position? Uh, I guess that would be me. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds, sounds really great. Okay, so we can draft a, a position description for a program specialist, and then the next time the board meets, we'll have it for your, your review and approval, and then we'll also at that time, if depending on how things go, we, we can also ask for the initiate to try to recruit to fill that temporary position. Just to be clear, the 89 the temporary position is um, temporary non-civil service. It, there's no fringe associated with it. It's just the whatever the salary is. So can we extend it? Is that a difficult process? No. The first, I believe it is, you can extend it three times. Yep. Um, three, I got it right. Yes, three times. So a total of three 89 day appointments. And 89 days is based on full time. You can also do a half time position for 188 days, or and then so there's flexibility built in as far as that goes. Yeah, just a thought, and I don't know if you know anybody appropriate to put it, but it might be a good opportunity for somebody either within DLIR or elsewhere, other state offices who might be interested in coming in on that program specialist position, just for some of these TA into the position. Just an idea whether somebody from here and maybe somebody from D heard who's already benefits work or something. Yeah, so I mean it's totally up to the the um, constrictions of the hiring process are minimal compared to civil service. So there's a lot of flexibility if the board wants to hire. Of course, we would facilitate whatever and try to. Yeah, thank you. You don't need a motion. Pardon? You don't need a motion for this, right? Um, no, I think we'll need a motion when we actually do bring the position description to us. If, if I can, you know, just plead to the board, I think the, the sooner we can bring somebody that's, you know, 100% dedicated to the Hawaii Retirement Savings Program, the, the better and, and the more functional I think the uh, will, will be even as a board. So, I mean, I know Bill is, you know, doing this out of the love of his heart and, you know, other duties as a sign, but uh, getting that, getting somebody on board, even if it's an 89 day hire for the program specialist, will 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 kickstart us significantly going forward. Okay, um, any other discussion or do we have any public comment or testimony on agenda item 6C? If not, the next agenda item uh, is agenda item seven, feasibility study. And circling back to what Lewis just said, um, in considering the amount of work and effort involved in um, just to, to date so far, I would have to underscore what Lewis said. I mean, um, I think the department is more than, and I'm more than happy to help facilitate everything, but it's really, um, it's uh, more than I can uh, more than I could reasonably accomplish to give it full justice to 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 help set up the feasibility study. I think the board really needs a full time executive director to help facilitate that stuff. So um, we did um, draft language that Michael and I were looking at. So we have once we get somebody on board, then. We can have those discussions and probably the thought was maybe because that that item this feasibility study might be more appropriate for a pig the board may want to consider doing a, a pig for that but again that's for discussion down the road so i guess my message at this point is i think the board really needs an executive director to do justice 
as Lewis said, to help carry this thing forward. I have to admit, I'm a little confused about what we need to do or should be doing or want to do on a feasibility study. Because I think we all agree that a critical issue for us is what we need to do going into the next legislative session to get amendments to the, the act. Specifically to me, the real critical one is the opt out versus opt in. And, and every, you know, I also listened to this morning's webinar, which also really pointed out got it. You know, knocked out because without it, we can't partner with the exactly. states. And in order to get the level of fees we need and to make it worthwhile, we need to partner with other states. But I don't know that that's the same thing as we need. Uh, to me, you know, uh, what are your thoughts? We don't need to we need a feasibility study for that. Um, even even before you get to the idea of a pig that would talk about what to do on a feasibility study. So um, at one of our last meetings, we had that lady from another Kim Wilson. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, they've done a lot of the legwork. And there's a lot of research out there that supports the fact that an opt out is the way to go. So here we are trying to reinvent the wheel again. It just doesn't make sense. But again, to me, that's just one issue. And that's a big issue. It, it's a huge issue. But is that what? Okay, you know, as of now, it's, it's permissive. We don't have to do a feasibility study. The way the statute is written, it says the board may do a feasibility study in June or get whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, because if we feel that we need a feasibility study to back up our request for the opt out, then we need to get on that right away. And I'm not sure that we even have the time to do a feasibility study before going in next legislative session. I mean, Senator. Your thoughts on that? I would kind of agree. You don't have that much time. Right. Because frankly, if we don't have to do address opt out, opt in in the feasibility study, then in my mind, doing getting ahead on a feasibility study is not as urgent. I guess that's what I'm saying as well. I don't know if Angela's still on, but maybe she can do a Page. <laughs> really I am here. I am here. <laughs> Thank you. Man. It's it's getting late here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how can I help? I know you're talking about the desire, you know, the the desire for a feasibility study, and I apologize um, because I don't know the the person who was just speaking, but. You know, when it there's already there has a lot that's already been done, and I think you know the evidence just from the experience that we have with existing program states. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, to the extent you you would want to analyze opt in versus opt out, I think there's already a lot of data and evidence to suggest um, that uh, you know opt in is going to do a lot to significantly increase. Um, you know, participation by workers in the program. If the feasibility study objective is to assess, you know, uh, the trajectory of the program if Hawaii goes it alone versus partnering with another state, again, not surprisingly, you can have the you can have the numbers run, and it's going to show that partnering, especially given the small size of Hawaii, uh, you know, will show that it's gonna be beneficial for Hawaii to seriously consider partnering with another state. And we, you know, I just hosted the webinar earlier today with the new program states um, and Colorado had its, had, had its board meeting today and is well underway uh, in working out final agreements with the state of Maine to enter into the first partnership such that Maine could actually begin its pilot program later this year. So. Maine is going to, to move ahead with Colorado. That looks like it's coming together with respect to the interstate agreements uh, between the two states. So we'll see that first partnership. And there are other states that are interested in entering into that partnership, I believe. So there will be an option there for Hawaii to consider as it looks to the future, whether or not you need that you feel with legislators or the other policymakers to have hard numbers run specifically for Hawaii to document uh, to document that a partnership is likely to be more beneficial for the state, or if you need um, you know, a feasibility study 
to run the numbers to show that opt opt in um, versus opt out. Opt in is much more um, much more effective with respect to uh, no, pre opt out. Yeah, we have an opt in into the program. Then I mean, you can do the you can do that if you feel like you need the study and the numbers. But again, there's already a lot of information out there to support and also tailored to Hawaii even to support what you might need. So my understanding, and I was not here for the debates uh, in the legislature in the House, that <laughs> there was concern around impacts uh, to households that had low income. And uh, if there is a, if it is an opt-out program that they are automatically enrolled in, uh, they may, you know, essentially be surprised from a budgetary perspective, and it may throw their finances off. Uh, which is, you know, I can understand that concern. I think a feasibility study, from my perspective, we would want to try to address that concern, so that we can. It's not just a battle of the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also trying to get at the core uh, concerns of those um, those representatives. Mm -hmm. So that we can understand the cost benefit that we're talking about here. So if we, you know, if we, and what are some of the options? Like, can we ramp up uh, the mandatory contribution amount, you know, so that it starts low and then get them used to being in the program and then ramp it up? I know some pro some states have done that. You know, maybe we can um, offer different options so that uh, if we're going back to the legislature and asking them to do to reverse the uh, opt-in versus opt-out, then maybe we can give them some um, options for them to consider. Just just throwing that out there. Since you were a key player there, <laughs> yeah. the players that were in objection oh. to opt-out, are they still in the legislature and are they still a concern going forward? I would defer to Bill because I haven't been to the legislature. <laughs> but yeah. There's I, chairs now. Yeah. So but I, I don't know about the general sentiment and all of that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, if things hold true, I guess the uh, I, I think there's there's pretty strong support in the Senate. I think the house is more kind of Lindsay, if you remember, kind of, <laughs> but the, but yeah, the, there's so many other battles going on that in the last five years. So uh, I think, yeah, there, there's some change in the leadership. Uh, so Sylvia Luke was also a very strong supporter. And she's now the tech governor. So she's not even on the same So yeah, there's, I'm not, I might be able to, I'm not clear about what, what the situation is. And I would think that was, yeah, we'd have a we'd have a decent chance of a living. I think from the department's perspective in the feasibility study, we want to make sure the board understood all of the administrative costs associated with the program and the impacts of the department as well. Believe me, I'm not diminishing your concerns, but in my mind, we can wait on the feasibility study and don't have to get going on it immediately for that purpose. I think the time wise, right. the most critical part is still the, you know, the opt out. But it sounds like Hill is saying he wants a feasibility study to back up our request. But if I understood you correctly, Senator, you're saying it's not necessarily um, critical to have that. In the field, so. Is somebody on Zoom want to have comment or testimony? I, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to point out some other things, you know, for consideration is given that you are an opt in versus an opt out. I think the reality is, you know, looking ahead when you're looking for vendors to support your program, the fact that you're opt in and not opt out will make it challenging for Hawaii. It will also make it more challenging from a partnering perspective. So those are two, I think, important important considerations. And to the extent that this that the board would like to 
work with the legislature and consider program amendments that might change it from opt, uh, opt in to opt out. If again, there it, it would be helpful to have Hawaii specific modeling done to show that it will have a significant impact on the long-term viability of the program, then that is certainly something that that you all can can consider when you will need to have that information to to make that case. But it will be important. It will be an important consideration with respect to plan design in terms of vendors looking at your state and also other states uh, look that are willing to partner uh, with Hawaii. And again, I know from 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 discussions that I've had that again opt in, you're going to have higher levels of participation than you're likely to have uh, with an opt in arrangement. And so that is something out there that that folks, when they're looking at, at Hawaii and looking at engaging with the program, these will be factors for consideration. You know, and to go back to Brian's point, the money that is allocated in the current or the upcoming fiscal year um, could be moved to a subsequent fiscal year, including the following fiscal year for the feasibility study. That's a relatively minor ask of the legislature. You know, as far as what to go in and look at and opening up the whole thing, that's, I think, tactics and strategies that board has to take into account for what exactly to go to and what exactly to go for changes next session and what some of those implications will be. And I would suggest that uh, if we do this uh, feasibility, so however way it looks, like so, you know, I see that there are like two feasibility studies or like a, a, a statutory amendment study and then a feasibility study, maybe is a better way to describe it. The statutory amendment should actually include proposed language and not just saying, you know, we need to make it um, the opt out, we need to actually propose language or someone. Make proposed language. Um, any other comments? If not, anybody on Zoom have anything they want to say? I think we're at the point now where we're ready to wrap up. Um, I guess then the next question would be do you want to set another board meeting? And when? So, if we are able, we should be able to initiate the recruitment process, the department, relatively quickly. So, um, that is something that could the executive director position itself could be posted next week, and we can start receiving applications at that point. Um, so, or do you want to uh, wait to see how many applications we get in and proceed from there to do to be announced the next meeting? What's the board's pleasure? We can set a meeting, and if we're not ready, we can push it back. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sure. I, I agree with that. So I have a feeling during the summer we'll have a hard time trying to get all of us together for a meeting anyway. So what are you looking? I'm not looking at anything. I know um August gets a little bit trickier for myself. So like I know I have to travel for work like the to the 11th, I think, and then I'm on leave for a couple of weeks right now. So before the 7th or August or late August. I'm trying for the week of July 31st. July 31st, August 4th, is that week? Sure. July 31st, August 4th. July 31st is a Monday. 
Yes. Yep. Okay, Tuesday, Tuesday, a good Tuesday. day for everybody. Okay. 2.45? Well, August the 1st at 2.45. <coughs> And then we will put out an agenda with the place. And then we will try to, does this room work for everybody? So that I'm amazed, but okay. It is a maze to get here, right? Yeah, I want to see me try to get Okay, well, we will finalize that and I'll let you folks know as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.